Okay, I'll just try to speak up, and hopefully you can all hear me. Let me know if you can. Uh, I'd also like to uh, recognize my, co my collaborators, Dave Huggins, who's actually with USDA ARS, and Gerard Burkhauser at Washington State University. What I want to do today is to talk about ion dynamics on synthetic resin membranes. Uh, that's these things, some, um, a number of you have used them, uh, but quite a number of you have not really seen them. So I'm going to give you a real quick history of uh, what they are. Going, let's first go all the way back to 1850 when the ability of soils to, uh, to hold cations was discovered by pouring ammonium in the top and watching the calcium come out the bottom. Soils have a natural ability to hold a lot of cations. Come around 1935, they found out that, that by grinding up phonographs, that this material actually holds a lot of uh, ions. So that was the first synthetic resin ion exchangers. And one of the things they first started using with that was to actually put nutrients on them to see whether they would work as slow release fertilizers. That idea didn't really pay, but it kind of tells you that, oh, this thing can go both ways. Uh, beginning around 1950, the resin exchange membrane or resins started to get used more and more for more like soil testing applications. And I'm basically going to be talking a little bit about the uh, PRS probes which were developed at the U of S um, and were commercialized by Western Ag Innovations starting in about 1996. So they've been around for quite a number of years. And they look something like this. There's the uh, anion probe, the orange one there, and that will be positively charged so it attracts negative ions such as nitrate and sulfate. And then there's the cation probe, so it's negatively charged, the, the resin, and it attracts uh, the positively charged ions like calcium and uh, potassium. Now what I wanted to do today is essentially uh, kind of quickly go and, and answer the question, well what actually happens when you put these in soil. That's really all I really wanted to do. And I'm going to go through three different experiments which sort of show what happens. Now the first one we can call this my, my bin experiment. We basically just took a silt loam soil, Troy did in North Dakota, and we either uh, left them dry, close to permanent wilting point, or we wetted them up to field capacity, or we totally saturated them, brought the water right up. And then, then what, after a couple of days, what we did is we uh, put a bunch of probes in them. We took them out after three hours, after one day, after three days, and after seven days. And after seven days, we then took them all out, and then we started swapping. We put the ones in the dry, for example, here. Let's go in here. We put them out in the dry, and we, and we, we washed it. There's a bit of a blip there because we washed it and put it back in the dry, so you can kind of see it falls the same with that little blip. Or we took it out of the dry and put it into the saturated, or we put it into the one at field capacity. And so we kind of get an idea, again, we looked at it after another day or another seven days. Well, what happens? Uh, here's what we have for our nitrate. And what we can see is, uh, uh, hey, when we're dry, we've got very slow diffusion, low mineralization. It's, it's, it's really slow and it continues that way, but if we wet it up to saturation, it very quickly goes up to where it would have been if it had been saturated the whole time. Saturated often picks up some nitrate initially a bit quicker sometimes than in this dryer, uh, but the uh, one that was in field capacity is probably go will we'll also be mineralizing at a faster rate, so quite often we'll see them go up a little bit higher. Um, you see that when we swap, I'm just showing here the one that went from dry to saturated, kind of, okay, quickly, it looks like this one. But we put it in saturated, it doesn't quickly go and look like dry anymore. Once the probes are on, or once the ions are on the probes, they're going to basically stick there unless something else comes along and pushes them off and moves them away. It's a little bit like remediating solenistic soils. With sodium on there, you have to do two things. You've got to take it off and you've got to move it away. Same thing with these probes. If it's, if it's on there, it needs something else to come along and displace it and move it away, otherwise it will stay there. So this is what it looked like for nitrate. 
come up through something like potassium. Uh, you can see that it looks quite a bit different from nitrate. Uh, right now we have our, we are kind of looking there, we look in there and see, oh, that dry soil, it's really, why, why is it actually looking like it wants, can hold more potassium than our saturated and our moist soil? That doesn't make any sense. And I actually had to go back and learn more about, go back to my old soil chemistry. And one of the things, if you recall, is that uh, uh, on, your, on your clays and your soil, when, the, when they're dry, the, uh, the, or in a wet soil, it favors the divalent cations, so like calcium and magnesium. Well, as it dries down, they are, get less active and the potassium can be then dominate. That's why we often see uh, stuff like this, and then when we wet them, well, then they go along and more or less look like this. The other thing that you notice with potassium, and we often see that, is that it quite quickly goes up to where it's gonna go on the probe, and after that, it's in equilibrium with, what is, with what's coming in and off the uh, in solution, so it goes more or less constant over time. And here's the uh, calcium. Uh, I just wanted to show that, unlike potassium, it does was quite a lot lower when it was dry. And that's like what, like I say, the uh, activity really goes up there, and that's why potassium went down when it went, when it got saturated. Um, here's another one that, uh, well, why manganese? Uh, that's why one of the micronutrients kind of. I often use it as an indicator of basically of saturation. What's happening over that one week under saturated conditions is that we're starting to develop more anaerobic conditions. And when you go anaerobic, you're first going to, uh, well, oxygen's gone, they use that up, then they use the nitrate. But after that, they start using the manganese, they convert it to a form that's more mobile. Then they use the iron, or they put that into a form that's more mobile. So under anaerobic, conditions, you'll often see a real uh, jump in manganese and, uh, and iron. And uh, we can see that here. But as soon as we, again, change conditions, again, we come down quite quickly, uh, they, they, they actually adjust both ways. In other words, because manganese isn't the one that's really held very strongly, it can get displaced and it will go, go back to where <coughs> it would have been in the dry soil or in the moist soil. Or if we're dry to begin with, you'll see this one jumped up even faster because that soil after one week was even more anaerobic than it was initially. So kind of some of the kind of neat things you can kind of see. Um, next example I'm going to give you is actually done at a, in a student lab at WSU by Jim, in the class of Jim Harsh. And basically, they uh, added four different amendments to subsoil, non-manure, compost, and straw. It was either that moist or saturated. And in this case, they just left them for 12 days. Um, again, we see some of these, uh, uh, this, this actually, here was quite a large increase in the nitrate going from non to saturated. Uh, but what we can see, like when we add an amendment that increases nitrate, that will, like manure, we can go up. However, if we saturate it, it's poof, gone. If we added compost or straw, they immediately, in all cases, went down to pretty well zero at the, uh, but at the end of 12 weeks. And the reason for it is, is actually different under moist and saturated conditions. And uh, the reason for that, well, one of the things you might say, well, why didn't you lose all your nitrate in your saturated? Did you go anaerobic in this situation? And I can say, well, no, we didn't, because I don't see any manganese, I didn't see any iron in that one. And the reason is, is because it was a subsoil, very low available carbon. Well, throw in some carbon with your uh, system, and then all of a sudden, and then the last one I was showing you, we had numbers of about 10 to 15 at the highest. Well, you can see that if you, again, you do, do everything, give it carbon and make it saturated, we can see numbers you know, that are hundreds of times higher. So that's why I can say, yes, definitely, they've gone anaerobic in these situations and we've got a lot of denitrification happening. Whereas in our uh, field voice, it's probably mostly uh, uh, immobilization that's 
decreasing the amount of nitrate going, being absorbed on our probes. Uh, phosphorus, we often see that it gets a bennet, it increases uh, on the probes by quite a lot under saturated conditions. Under moist conditions, we can see the benefit of manure or compost, uh, but when we saturated, we actually got, actually see a, that they, those amendments didn't increase phosphorus any higher. We got some kind of interaction going on, which I actually don't totally understand. Potassium, like we were looking at before, we can understand is that it actually, its activity is actually higher under the less wet conditions. So it was actually higher in our moist soil. And again, it was benefited, in this case, in bo under both situations, with the addition of things like manure and compost. It's all very uh, cool stuff to look at, but all of this is kind of in the lab. And I said, well, you guys know, well, it's good to show some stuff from in the field as well. Uh, what, I, what I wanted to show was actually a kind of cool study by, done by Gerard Burkhauser at WSU. We were looking at uh, fall burn versus control, and, and, and basically they were monitoring these with, with PRS probes in that spring just after seeding. And what they did was they put them in the field and left them for one day, or then they left them a week. And then they took them out another week, another week, another week. So they total of five weeks altogether that they were monitoring the uptake of nutrients on the PRS probes. And this is just showing the, these two are the burn. And, and this year, the burned uh, both went up quite a lot higher nitrogen supply. Uh, here's the control quite a bit lower. But in 2012, we see, well, this, this is a pretty different pattern. One, we don't see the effect of burning in the same way. And two, we're seeing this much more spiky uh, pattern to the utilization over time. Well, the spiky pattern is a lot related to the fact that this one started out very dry, and it got precept was basically spiked around here, pretty well bang on with that. Whereas in this case, the, it was moister all the way through. And again, this pattern of precip was actually quite closely related to our pattern in nitrogen uh, on the PRS probes. The other thing that's different between these two years is that this, in 2010, the whole study was conducted about a month earlier. And so because of that, it was a lot cooler conditions. And under those conditions, having a black surface burnt, you're warmer. Warmer makes a bigger difference when you're colder. Once, you, once you're warmer, a week later, uh, a month later, it's not having that same kind of effect. So that's sort of what, what we were kind of seeing with nitrate nitrogen in this example. And oh, this is another thing that kind of followed up on it. This is looking at they measured the uh, plant nitrogen in, at the end of that whole PRS monitoring period, five weeks, and uh, found a very close relationship between you know what they saw in one day what they saw as plant nitrogen after five weeks or after one week compared to so again it's that the fact that these things aren't just related to what's on the probe but what the plant is seeing. Another thing kind of follow up and follow up some of what we've seen before is that with K we're not quite seeing the same patterns as we said with nitrate but again it's probably almost always going up to uh, to, to, to sort of its equilibrium for soil. And in this case, it's where you are in the soil. So these were, some, of, some were done at uh, lower slope positions, others were done at upper slope positions, eroded. And we're seeing uh, that that's mostly what gets reflected in the PRS pattern, in the pattern of PRS. So I think in this year there was some increase in the burn, at least especially under the upper slope positions. So what can we learn about that and what can we say we should, you know, what implications does that have to how we use these in a study? Well, one of the things that you kind of quickly learn is that things are really most dynamics right away. So, especially in the first week. Um, the other thing we can say looking at these things, that these, the measurements that you're, you're going to get are definitely very sensitive to soil moisture or soil moisture fluctuations. But they're also very sensitive to, to, like, for example, where you are in the landscape, or fertilizer treatments, or amendment treatments. Uh, very sensitive to all kinds of things. What are the implications for that? 
Uh, one is, is, well, how long should you vary these things for when you're using them in an experiment? And again, it always depends on your objectives, but I often uh, like to uh, maybe put them in for one week. You, for most ions, you really don't learn a lot more if you leave them in longer. Uh, they, for some, in some cases, you might continue to accumulate a bit of, uh, for example, nitrate over longer times. But for a lot of ions, they're just, after one week is, unless conditions change drastically, after one week is the same as what you're going to see after four weeks. Um, well, what, well, the next question is, well, how, when should I bury them? Because uh, I don't have enough money, for example, to bury them continuously like they did in that experiment. Well, like, like you can see in the experiment in Washington, the most important thing is to get them where the action is. And that was in that spring period. Uh, so we're always saying use them where roots are active, where the nutrients are more or less most likely to be released. Uh, there's a big advantage in having other ions to tell you something about the other ions, like my manganese helps me understand what's going on with nitrate. Uh, site monitoring, knowing what's happening with moisture and temperature, helped me to understand why my PRS numbers were looking like in that, in that experiment. Uh, and what I find is any time that you kind of want to know like when nutrients are being released or bioavailable or where, uh, these, are, these are very useful tools that can put in with very little disturbance and kind of tell you some pretty interesting information about your system.